to uh, thank everyone for showing up. We've got a great, uh, I mean, the place is packed right now. It's awesome. Uh, it's been a while since we've been doing, you know, we had a break during COVID, but we're back in person and uh, this showing is just awesome. So nevertheless, um, we uh, just a reminder, we have uh, dedicated this season to, uh, to uh, Sandy's memory, uh, Sandy Blundy, uh, which we I uh, really appreciate uh, all the effort she's she put in over the years and all the effort that uh, that Bob does as well. So I appreciate um, all the work that uh, they put in and uh, thank you very much for showing up. I'm going to hand it off to Rian. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Rihanna. I am the Marine Program Coordinator for the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve that is now housed under the North Coast Land Conservancy. 
Um, so just a little bit about NCLC, as most of you probably already know, but since 1986, NCLC has been acquiring and managing their land for habitat and its conservation value. And most recently, we have the Rainforest Reserve, which uh, runs southbound from Cannon Beach into Halen Bay. And so together with the Rainforest Reserve, a state park, and the Marine Reserve, this forms about a 32 square mile conservation corridor. So if you didn't know, in February of 2022, NCLC adopted the Friends of Cape Falcon Group into the now Cape Falcon Marine Reserve Program. And in 2016, the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve was established and it is the northernmost and newest of all five of Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's five marine reserve sites. And so our marine reserve is located just off Oswald West State Park near Manzanita. And this site includes a marine reserve plus two marine protected areas, which is about a 20 square mile area of conserved coastal ocean here on the North Coast. So what makes Cape Falcon unique is that this site has some of the highest visitation rates of any of the Oregon marine reserves. And it is also heavily influenced by the Columbia River plume, plume, which is an incredibly ecologically important process for waters here in the Pacific Northwest. Our marine reserve is also very deep compared to others where depths can reach up to over 80 meters. And uh, it also has a lot of shallow rocky reef habitat, which is pretty uncommon in some of our waters here in Oregon. So along with NCLC's mission to conserve Oregon's coastal lands forever, NCLC's, NCLC's adoption of the Marine Reserve Program has really expanded that land-sea connection here on the North Coast. The purpose of this program is to really educate on and advocate for the abundant values the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve brings here to the state of Oregon. And our goal is really to also support ocean conservation and research, foster ocean stewardship and awareness, as well as support community science. And so if you're interested to learn more about what we do, or if you want to get involved, you can please grab some of our brochure information on the back table, or please feel free to visit our website. And so as our marine reserves are approaching its 10th anniversary, uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Lindsay Ellsworth. She's from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and she is the newly appointed Marine Reserves Program Leader. So. Lindsay is based out of Newport, Oregon. Uh, she's been serving in the interim role since June 2022. And prior to that, she has served as the Marine Ecological, Marine Reserves Ecological Project Leader over the previous five years. She has worked for over 13 years at the interface of science, policy, and marine resource management issues. Prior to coming to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Lindsay worked on a variety of marine issues, including international policy and trade of marine species, bycatch in Pacific Island fisheries, endangered species research, and coral reef ecology. Lindsay received her doctoral degree from the University of British Columbia, where she studied data poor marine species in Southeast Asia. And she also has a master's degree in coastal environmental management from Duke University and she served as a Fulbright Scholar in Brazil. Wow. wow. <laughs> so with that, Lindsay really brings her excellent communication skills and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary experience in social ecological systems to her role with ODFNW. So before she gets started, I would just like to remind everybody to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Save your questions for the end, as we will have time to answer those at the end of the presentation. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lindsay Ellsworth. Give her a round of applause. I'm Lindsay. I'll sit down for you online in a minute. Um, if you feel like you need a mask, because there's quite a bit of us, there's yeah. some extras in the back in case you want. Just raise your hand. I'll be happy to bring you a mask if you wish to have one on. Okay, well, we're back here to change your mind. All right. So I'm Lindsay. I'm the new program leader with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Reserves Program. But I've been with the Marine Reserves Program for a while, ever since I moved to Oregon, almost six years ago, in the same program, working on the marine reserves. So um, I'm very excited to share with you what we've been learning from our marine reserves um, kind of over the last 10 years that we've put them in place. Um, 
I know we have people online, but if there's a burning question while we're going through some things, um, I'd like I'd like to think of this more as kind of like a more of a, a chat or an interaction. So if there's something that you have a question about, uh, please feel free just to speak up. It'll be more engaging for everyone, and I'll try and remember to repeat it for those friends online. Okay. Oops. Here we go. All right. So in case any of you are new to learning about the marine reserves that we have here in Oregon. We put them in place for three main reasons, for conservation of biodiversity, but we put them in place also for research, research to inform management decisions. And we also put them in place for communities, specifically trying to balance the need for conservation and fishing opportunities. So by putting these marine reserves and protected areas in place, we wanted to make sure that um, they avoid significant impact to the coastal communities um, and local ocean users. So we have five sites off the Oregon coast. And when I say marine reserve, I'm talking about a place where ocean development and uh, fishing is prohibited. And those are these places in red that you can hopefully see off of that map. Um, many of the marine reserves are also surrounded by a blue marine protected area. So that is a place where uh, ocean development is not allowed and some, but not all types of fishing are allowed. So there is some conservation happening in those areas as well. In Oregon, we had a staggered implementation of our marine reserves. They didn't all go in right at once. This was a new management tool for the state of Oregon. So our first two marine reserves down at Redfish Rocks off the South Coast and Otter Rock at the Central Coast, uh, those harvest restrictions began in 2012. We had two more marine reserves come online in 2014. So at the Cascade Head Marine Reserve and Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. And then our youngest one is right off the coast here um, off of Cape Falcon. It's our marine reserve that is the newest and also furthest to the north. Everything that we do in our program comes from legislative mandates. Um, and these mandates and this whole process for marine reserves started back in 2008 with a governor's order that basically tasked ODFMW with moving forward with a planning process for marine reserves. Um, that planning process went forward and resulted in a house bill in 2009, which basically started those first two sites, started some funding for the program, and the program really started to spin up from 2010 onwards. Um, there was a Senate bill that happened in 2012 with some additional planning. We had those other three sites come online. Um, and then there were also policy recommendations back with the governor. And all these things really drive what we do in our program. So as I mentioned, ODFW is the agency um, tasked with implementation of the marine reserves. But we also have some other government partners uh, that help with different aspects of the marine reserves, like the state police and state parks for uh, enforcement and state lands as well. And then we work with a lot of different research partners and groups um, to help study the ocean in our communities that we have in the ocean. So maybe some fascinating stuff for some, but boring stuff for others. We have six permanent full-time staff and we have a budget of just under $2 million per biennium, which is um, state financial language speak for every two years. Um, and so with that money, we fund our six permanent staff members, and we also do all of the following things, management plans, ecological and human dimensions monitoring. When I say human dimensions, I'll talk about that a couple of different times to really think socioeconomics, and I'll share some fun things we're learning about that. Uh, we do outreach and community engagement uh, as part of our staff tasks, and then uh, we do contract out with Oregon State Police for uh, enforcement. So just a quick overview of what do we do with our ecological monitoring. So we have four core different tools that we use to study lots of different ecosystem components. Um, the Marine Reserves Program is the first ecosystem focused monitoring program that we have in Oregon's near shore waters. So we don't just care about fish, 
we don't just care about um, certain species of invertebrates. We want to know about the algae. We want to know about the oceanographic processes. It's really an ecosystem focus here. And so we have four main tools that you can see here that we use to gather this information at each of the sites. We also have some main collaborations that kind of expand what we're able to do. And so we also study juvenile fish. We uh, try to look at the biodiversity in the tide pools uh, and also understanding oceanographic influences. So our program sampled before the marine reserves went into effect. So kind of before there was any closure happening. And then we also continue monitoring after. And so this kind of sampling before and after allows us to try and understand what changes might be related to, say, putting this marine reserve in place and what changes, say, might be due to just natural fluctuations in the environment or maybe changing ocean conditions. Uh, this is um, basically a, a look of the Oregon coast. If you flip it on its side over here on, ooh, here's my pointer. Do I know how to use it? Not well. Okay. Uh, so on this furthest side over here, there we go. This is basically the border with Washington. And here's the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve right there in red. The marine reserves are in red. We travel down the central coast all the way to the other side, which is down at the south coast and the Port Orford uh, reserve down there. So we monitor at these reserves and in these green areas, which are comparison sites. So they're basically places that have similar habitat and oceanography to the marine reserves that we can then use to compare. So that's a lot of sites. Um, so we're gonna take off our ecological focus. We're gonna leave our masks on the side of the desk for a minute. And we're gonna um, dive into some of our socioeconomic research or our human dimensions research. And this really tries to focus on that community's goal to really try and understand the impacts of, you know, how does putting say a marine reserve or a protected area or a certain type of management in place, how does that impact local communities? Are these impacts economic? Are they social? Are they cultural? How do they change over time? And I feel like that's a really important and cool aspect of our program that you don't find in a lot of other natural resource management programs, that they are mandated to do this work. So what are you finding? Oh, I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay, I'm just setting the scene, setting the scene. I'm getting there, I promise. Okay, so again, this human dimensions really tries to get an understanding about how people use, value, and rely on the ocean and its marine resources. Again, just because human dimensions, at least in the marine science world, is not something that a lot of people think of right away. People often think of the critters, they don't often think of the socioeconomic aspects. So we are really interested in trying to understand what are people's knowledge, attitudes, and support about the marine reserves and the marine reserve program? Does this change over time? Remember, this is a new policy tool that stems from legislation. So is there support for the program or should we do better? Um, again, what are the, say, economic impacts of putting this policy in place? And what specifically are those impacts on, say, commercial or recreational fishermen um, or on, say, local businesses and communities? And let's not forget that there are social impacts. Um, and so any sort of new management policy can create new conflict. It can bring up issues related to trust and uncertainty. Um, it can change relationships, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Sometimes relationships change the same. So again, trying to understand what are the, the changes that have happened um, or that we would expect to happen by putting these areas in place. And so kind of at the big challenge for our program right now, we've done a lot of work trying to understand you know, what are, what are these things? What's important? And how has it changed a little bit right now? But in terms of thinking about where we go in the future, I think the challenge is really what impacts are significant? And especially when those impacts might be significant to some, but not significant to others. Whose impact really matters? 
and um, and who decides whose impact really matters? Is it you know people that are local in the communities? Is it you know the people who are impacted? Is it people that live in Portland in the I five quarter since that's where the majority of the population lives? Anyway, these are all good questions for us to be considering as Oregonians when we think about the marine research program and where it goes moving forward. All right, so perhaps why am I here sharing some of this with you a little bit? So one of those pieces of legislation that I mentioned earlier, Senate Bill 1510, said, you know what, in 2023, let's have a programmatic check-in. Again, this is a new program. Let's make sure it's up and working properly. Um, and so as part of this process, ODFW was tasked with writing a big 10-year report summarizing what we've learned. And for better or for worse, it happened over the COVID years. So we all sat at home and worked furiously writing and analyzing and synthesizing lots of different types of data to be able to share about what we've learned over the past 10 years. And so you can sort of see 2010 is when we started doing some of that monitoring before the marine reserves started. You can see the implementation of the different marine reserves um, here through 2020. Now, as part of that process, there was also a, a university just this year that did kind of like a peer review of what we wrote and what we found. Were we doing good science? Were, are we meeting the mandates? Um, I'm not here to talk about that, but the short answer is that in general, yes, we are meeting the goals and mandates, but they had suggest some suggestions of how we could do better. I'm, I'd love to talk about that, but not as part of this, because this is all about what did we find with what we've done so far? Um, and so all of this kind of feeds into what's happening currently in the legislative uh, session, which is informing the legislature about this report, about the assessment, and the political process plays out with what happens with the program moving forward. Okay. So here we go. Do you want to ask your question again? <laughs> what have you found? That's right. What have we learned? Great question. So after 10 years, uh, we've developed near shore sampling tools, both for biological communities and human communities that actually work and work well in our high energy environment here. We've developed a lot of different communication tools to actually be able to try and share back information about our marine reserves. So we have a website, we have monthly newsletters, we have a cool data dashboard where you can go and explore some of our ecological data with kind of a choose your own adventure type format. So pick your own reserve, pick a species and see what the data are saying over the years. Uh, we have a Flickr page in case you want to see what it's like out there on the boat. You want to see those species or uh, what it's like while we're out there doing research. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel where we show videos. So I think sometimes underwater, sometimes ones we put together. Do you could you give us the address, the, the, the website and the YouTube how how we Yes. So the short answer is if you go to OregonMarineReserves.com, it'll be on the last slide of the slideshow where I say, thank you, any questions? <laughs> um, anyway, and then you can, from there, you can get links to the YouTube page, to the Flickr site, to all those sorts of things. Okay, so we developed the tools. Good step in the right direction. Uh, we also have developed robust data sets for tracking change in the ecological side of things, but also in that socioeconomic side of things. I know you're chomping at the bit, so I'm just gonna dive right in now to the ecological side of things. Um, but just before we talk about the changes that we've seen and what we're learning, um, it's generally accepted in the scientific community that with the species that we have off our coast here, it's really too short of a time frame for us to be able to see any changes in those species because they're long lived, they grow very slowly, that are attributable to the marine reserve, any marine reserve, even the oldest ones. Um, so at a minimum, 10 to 15 years, could be up to 40 years. Whew, that's a long time, but it's okay. Good things come to those who wait. So, we have found changes and we are seeing things in the ocean. So here's what we find. We're gonna start down at the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. 
And so we've seen shifts in abundance. This is from our scuba diver data at both the marine reserve and in the comparison area site with that top graph here is densities of the sunflower sea star. And so we've seen declining densities of the sunflower sea star over time. That middle graph shows purple urchins. And so we've actually seen some increases in purple urchins as we've been seeing that decline in the sunflower sea stars. And this bottom graph is crustos coral and algae within that picture with the urchins. It's that pink that you see on the rocks. And we've also seen an increase in this too. And so this crustose coral and algae can also be a sign that um, we're starting to get urchin barrens off the coast. So um, kind of declines in kelp that are associated with too many urchins because a predator like the sunflower sea star has declined. So can you put into context the, the sunflower sea star time frame with the wasting disease we saw on other sea stars? Yes, it's almost like you're predicting slides to come. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, dot on the map, this dotted line right there, um, that's actually the outbreak of sea star wasting disease. So maybe you've heard of sea star wasting disease that impacted uh, the Oregon coast, a lot with those intertidal sea stars, the ochre sea stars, the orange and purple ones. It's also had a big impact on some, but not all, uh, of the subtidal sea star species. So the ones that don't live in the shallow tide pools, but just in the deep. Um, and so this is one of the deeper species that has experienced a decline, likely due to that sea star wasting disease outbreak. And it hasn't recovered yet. But I'm going to show you here a video. I can get it to work. I got it. Okay, thank you. So here we are diving at the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. You can see that China rockfish, but really notice the urchins that you see on the rocks mm -hmm. and that pink crustose coral and algae. I mean, they're almost everywhere. Um, and this is a very nice day down off of. Uh, would you rather have left slide up there? Uh, people are saying yes in here. Ooh, and look, we can see some schools of black rockfish in the background. Oh, we might have to play it again one more time. All right, all right. Uh, if you just hit that play button. How deep is this? Oh, where do we take this video? I'm going to say maybe 15 or 20 meters, which is somewhere between 40 to 60 feet. Uh, that, so that's the China rockfish. You can see the pink on the rocks is that coral and algae, and then you can see the urchins. Um, Sometimes this is a, a day with wonderful visibility because you can identify those schools of uh, black rockfish in the background, but sometimes we don't get visibility. Okay. We're, oh, that's me. Is that considered a high or low density of urchins? That's a high one. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to move up the coast to the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. So central coast off of Yahats. Um, and so this, this marine reserve is actually the backbone of our knowledge about low oxygen conditions in the water. And that's because some academic researchers have been doing research in this area for very, very long periods of time, even before the marine reserve was put into effect. And so this is a place where we've seen um, kind of changes in fish and invertebrate communities due to changes in oxygen conditions in the water. So kind of blanked out some of that oceanographic data that's always hard to read. Anything that's kind of near that black line is considered very, very low oxygen in the water. Due to what? Poof. <laughs> I know, <laughs> tough crowd here. So the question was due to what? What causes this low oxygen in the water? And off the Oregon coast here, uh, I, I think maybe you've heard of the upwelling that happens. It has to do with the wind that blows strongly, typically in the summer. It causes a lot of productivity that happens. Um, and then when all that really cool productive stuff dies, it draws kind of some of the oxygen down. Also, when that water gets brought up, that water from the like deeper depths in the ocean also typically has low oxygen in the waters. Um, so it is naturally occurring here, but what we're starting to see is that it's becoming more frequent 
and also longer in duration. They used to be just kind of like short little snaps kind of during the month of August. Again, based on this long-term data from the site, I see we have a hint in the back one second. Um, where basically, if you look at the fish community, it went from being filled, oops, nope, filled with lots of fish to on these low oxygen days, that's the same location, no fish to be seen. Uh, but we do know that the fish come back, or at least in this area, when the conditions change. But so for example, up here off of Cape Falcon, we're really just starting to scratch the surface. And that area where the marine reserve is right now, it didn't have that backbone of knowledge of monitoring that was already there. And so fast forward, I might tease you with what we're learning about a Cape Falcon. Um, Anyway, but the backbone of what we understand about these low oxygen conditions comes from the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And because we have the oceanographic monitoring and the biological monitoring, we can combine them together to really better understand what's happening as these conditions change and what the implications are for the biological community. Now I've talked about the fish specifically, but we also have data on invertebrates. And so we, are able to know similar things about invertebrate communities. Okay, question in the back. Yeah, depth profile. Is it is it oxygen depletion all the way down from zero to deep, or is it uh, change as you go deeper? Um, so it depends on kind of how long of the period of sort of like the upwelling cycle and like how long it is. So the answer is sometimes yes, and that's when kind of typically we see the reports of like crabs and dead fish starting to wash up on the beach, maybe at the end of summer. Sometimes that is actually attributable to very low oxygen conditions, even in the shallow waters. Um, but if ooh, I'm diving down a rabbit hole with this real quick, and then I'm going to pull out and we're going to keep going. <laughs> For just a little bit. So um, sometimes that deep water uh, drops with oxygen kind of first and foremost. And so the creatures will move up into the shallower waters as there's kind of look fewer and fewer amounts of oxygen in the deeper habitat until it comes all the way up into the shallows and then some of them run out of the water. And, and, okay, we're moving on here. Lindsay, we have a question from one of our online viewers. Oh, well and, done. And I hope you're not an oceanographer. <laughs> <laughs> they are asking back to the sea star wasting. Oh, okay. Uh, Topic is I'm about to talk about more sea stars. Okay. okay. Is there any relationship between sea star wasting syndrome and the wasting syndrome that is now affecting the deer population? Deer? D-E-E-R? D-E-E-R. Ooh, um, I can't answer that question, but um I because I'm I'm not actually quite sure of the link between deer populations and sea stars. Um, but I'd be happy to put you in touch with a wildlife biologist who might be able to help answer some of those questions. So, thanks. No, oh, we're gonna skip that. All right, we're moving up the coast to Otter Rock Marine Reserve, which is just north of Newport, just south of Depot Bay. And this site, because it's kind of right in between Depot Bay and Newport, is our site where we actually have the most and easiest access to the site. So that means that we actually have the largest number of collaborative research projects at this site because of that uh, access. And so we're learning lots of different things. I'm gonna share about what we're learning related to um, some of the juvenile fish research that we're doing. Um, and so we put out these devices that mimic kelp habitat uh, offshore. They're called the standard monitoring units for the recruitment of fishes. And if you take each one of those letters, it spells Smurf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and, and so with our Smurfs, since they mimic this juvenile habitat that um, fish like to settle in in their younger years, uh, kind of we're able to catch some fish in there, we shake them out, and we're able to identify what types of species and to see kind of what recruitment patterns are like over the years. And so here we can see that for juvenile cabazon, in different years, we can see different trends um, and that the trends are mostly similar between the Otter Rock Marine Reserve and the comparison area. 
Oops, wrong button. All right, moving up the coast of Cascade Head. You guys getting excited for Cape Falcon? Woo, it's coming. Okay, on to Cascade Head in Lincoln City. So this is another Sea Star story. Um, again, lots of people know about sea stars in the intertidal tide pool areas, but not many people are able to see them and have kind of known what has happened with sea star wasting disease <laughs> to the ones that just live in the deeper waters. But we have a tool, this remotely operated vehicle that's basically like an underwater camera that you can drive with a joystick from a boat almost uh, that flies around and gets a lot of different um, underwater data on these deeper reefs. And so from the Cascade Head Marine Reserve, we've been able to see that these different sea stars have actually responded differently to sea star wasting disease. So for example, the blood star uh, has declined. I would say it's kind of been a loser. It's been declining over time. This false ochre star oddly has been a winner. Its population densities have increased at both the marine reserve and in the comparison areas. And so does that species live at deeper depths? They, they all live at similar depths okay. on, on the reef. So I, there's, I don't believe there's a depth component. Okay. And then this leather star, for example, it's kind of your solid as a rock, you know, tried and true. It hasn't changed very much, despite the fact that, you know, some populations have shown decline, some have shown increases, but mostly they've been stable across the board in terms of the numbers that we see. And maybe you're saying, okay, are you really sure about these numbers? Well, yes, actually, we are sure about these numbers because we go back to the same places and run the same transects to be able to count kind of over time. All right. Oh, here's another video. And we hit the button. Okay, so this is image from the remotely operated vehicle. You can see a sea star over here, sea cucumber down there. We're continuing along. Here's another one of the sea star species, a little black rockfish comes into play. And these are what these deeper reefs look like. And then that little one over there is a blood star. I don't know if you can see it. There we go. There's another blood star right there. There's another sea star. Yes. Anyway, so that's what the remotely operated vehicle kind of footage looks like. Nope, nope, I'm skipping. All right, finally, in our own backyard, Cape Falcon. All right, so one of the things that we've been able to do at the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve is actually expand our knowledge about oceanographic data up on this north coast here. If you look at the oceanographic data that's collected in Oregon waters, it's all focused on the central coast. There's nothing that's north of really you, you point ahead down in Newport, except our other marine reserve monitoring station. Uh, but so this is really exciting to try and see are the conditions up here, um, you know, closer to the Columbia River. What's it like here off the north, off the north coast? Because there are changes that are hap that's happening up here. And one thing that's really cool is that we've been able to see um, that black line here is that hypoxia line or also that low oxygen line. And so we can see on these data, which I believe are from 2020, um, we don't actually see any conditions of that like severe low oxygen at Cape Falcon here below that line. And what's interesting is that in 2020, we did see those conditions at the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve and at the Cascade Head Marine Reserve, but we didn't see them up north here. Um, and so we've now been able to successfully um, put out our oceanographic moorings off of Cape Falcon and off of Cape Mears. We've seen that the oceanographic conditions are very similar in those two areas. Um, and so we're starting to be able now to kind of pair that biological data that we have from say our hook and line surveys that we do up here with that oceanographic data. So for example, um, we know that we are starting to see higher lingcod catch rates on days when there's stronger upwelling based on oceanographic data that we've collected. And so that's good for us to know and consider 
as we're thinking about how these populations change over time. We're also, so that was a very reserve by reserve focus sort of look. Um, now I'm gonna talk about how each site is unique. Uh, so for example, on the ecological side of things with this hook and line tool that we use, we can look across the sites where we use this tool um, to be able to see, um, okay, mostly we catch a lot of black rockfish at all four of these marine reserves. It's the dominant fish that we catch. So, you know, that's kind of similar with those fish communities. But where it starts to differ, this is a canary rockfish. And so we catch some canary rockfish at other marine reserves, but we haven't caught any at the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Um, and actually likely the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve doesn't actually have good habitat for that uh, type of rockfish. And so, kind of a little bit of what we'd expect, but we're seeing it in the data. Uh, and also, for example, we catch the most China rockfish at our southernmost marine reserve, and we really don't see them in the data at the other marine reserve sites. So from this, we do know that we are protecting different types of communities with the different marine reserves we have along the coast. So we didn't put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, in terms of protecting the same species and the same habitat at every site, have a little, little bit of diversity. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the socioeconomic data. So we're leaving the ecological data behind, switching into the world of socioeconomics. And so you can think a little bit, a lot of our research has done trying to understand initially, how do these communities differ? And so they might differ in terms of what access to the ocean looks like. They might differ in terms of, say, recreational values or in the types of fisheries that they have at the different places along the coast. Again, that human dimensions research really focuses on trying to understand how people use value and rely on the ocean and its resources and how that changes over time. So we know that um, some of the highest recreational values associated with Cape Falcon um, are related to surfing. Whereas at the Otter Rock Marine Reserve, it's sort of equally dominated by both surfing and tide pooling. But tide pooling wasn't something that popped up as one of, say, like the top things people really value about the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're learning about knowledge, attitudes, and support, economics, and social impacts. So awareness and support for the marine reserves is increasing from when the program started at the beginning through until data that was collected in 2021. We see this across all the marine reserve sites. But what's really exciting is that here at Cape Falcon, even though it's our newest marine reserve, um, there were surveys done in 2015. So before that marine reserve started in 2016, and only 16% of visitors to the area knew that it was about to become a marine reserve. So there wasn't very much awareness kind of about the marine reserves. And then when we looked at the data from 2021, 60% of visitors are aware that Cape Falcon is now a marine reserve. That's, that's a very big change. Uh, and, and also a very exciting change to see kind of like the, the before and, and the after. Uh, we know that opposition to marine reserves is also decreasing. So again, if we're trying to understand what's kind of the support and awareness for the program, uh, we've seen decreasing trends over time in a variety of different stakeholder groups. Probably unsurprisingly, the social and economic impacts vary across different sectors and different scales. One of the reasons why I like this picture here on this side, oops, nope, the other side, not where the arrows are, sorry about that. <laughs> Still, ooh, there we go, thank you, is that it basically shows a recreational fisher, an artist, and um, a grandmother who takes children tide pooling, all thinking and learning about marine reserves. And so you can think about how the social and economic impacts of those three people related to the marine reserves would differ. 
So a lot of people are very interested about what are the economic impacts on fishers. Remember, one of the main goals of the marine reserves is about communities. We don't want to put these marine reserves in places where there are going to be significant adverse impacts to local ocean reserves and communities. That also includes recreational and commercial fishermen. Our finding, again, is that it's complicated. Oh, I, but I'll, I'll go into some more detail. <laughs> and part of why it's so complicated is when you think about economic impacts, it's not just one metric of an economic impact, right? There's actually different scales of economic impact you can look at. So you can think of if there was a very severe economic impact, be it positive or negative, you would see it at a state level. Like if we look at all the fisheries data summed up at the state level, it would be there. But maybe we only see an impact in a particular commercial fishery, or maybe it's just in a recreational fishery. Maybe those impacts are only related to like a specific port and like a, a geographical place of interest. Or maybe some impacts you can't really see at the other levels, but you can really only get at if you talk to certain individuals. And so we did research at all of these different levels. And so that's why the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> can't be summed up quickly. So I'm going to talk about the largest level and also the smallest level. And then we can leave the other levels for discussion later. Um, so at the statewide level, financial economic impacts across multiple different things that we looked at um, were not substantial. And that's probably not too surprising given that the marine reserves and protected areas make up only 9% of our state waters. They're very small areas, but also the fisheries we have here cover offshore areas that are considered federal waters. They also include distant water fisheries where people go to Alaska or other faraway places to catch fish, but all that economic information gets attributed back to Oregon. And so we didn't see any impact at the big statewide level, but we looked. Uh, we learned that some fisheries are more vulnerable than others. Again, probably not surprising, depending on which one you're talking about, but the most vulnerable fishery is actually the nearshore ground fish fishery. Again, the, the sort of intuitively should make sense because this fishery targets species that are highly habitat dependent and highly habitat dependent like in those nearshore areas. Um, and also we found that uh, the ports that are most dependent on this type of fishery are the places where there's the most vulnerable communities. And actually, this is Garibaldi. Um, and so you can think about, say, compared to Newport, there's not a huge diverse economy in Garibaldi, say, as compared to Newport. So the income, say, from, from a nearshore fisherman, if it's changed, you know, if it changes because of a marine reserve, there's not a lot of other economic opportunity say like for that fisherman and that fisherman's family. So it makes a bigger impact in that place. Whereas in Newport, there are other sectors of the economy, um, possibly other areas supporting fishing families. Again, I'm kind of summarizing a bunch of different metrics that we looked at, but just so you know. Um, and then again, as we kind of drill down to an individual level, again, sort of across the coast. But in general, if you talk to individual, say, fishermen, mo most of them will admit that they haven't experienced significant economic impacts due to the reserves. But the reserves are one of many things that causes uncertainty as they like plan their business. You know, what sort of new conservation or management measures are coming next? And how is that gonna impact my business model? Of where I go, how I go, when I go. Um, and also coming out of interviews that we've done relate to a sense of place. Um, you know, people grew up fishing in certain areas, even with family members. You know, and there's, again, based on variety of interviews, people want to be able to go to those same places and do it with, you know, with their children or the next generation. 
Again, it's not saying that they can't do it in other places. You know, they can, but it's sort of like an identified sense of place that's lost. Again, this brings up the issue about, you know, sort of like it's an impact. It's there. You know, what what impacts make the most are you know are most meaningful for different people. So much of the point is where you've identified where there's vulnerability. That means over a different time scale, there's the greatest potential for growth. Because the, tell me more. Well, the worldwide impact of of these kind of reserves or protected areas, there's a much larger track record over time than we have created here in Oregon. But around the whole world, there's a bigger track record showing the establishment of, of you know this one, greater uh, fish. Uh, yes. Greater age. Yes. But we're probably going to get there, aren't we? Um, <laughs> we're not going to get there a lot. Okay. But you are correct. Um, our marine reserves here are pretty young. And um, it's too soon to see changes attributable to marine reserve impacts. But in other places around the world, in other places that say we're heavily fished and they set aside these places for protection, we have they have seen rebounds in those fish populations. And again, if you stop fishing in an area, it does mean that fish can grow bigger as long as they stay in that area and don't swim outside where they can be caught. Um, you know, and older, bigger fish tend to produce more offspring. And so that's kind of like the driver that helps keep the population growing. And so some of our marine reserves here are, are I think, potential candidates for that. Others, and I actually think Cape Falcon is one that probably won't show that, that strong of an impact. That's because as part of the, ooh, I'm really diving down a hole here, but these are good questions. Um, stick with us online if you're still there. All right. Um, just because of the planning process. Uh, the planning process involved communities and involved different stakeholders at the table trying to balance those different goals, protecting biodiversity, making sure we can do research in those places, making sure they were in places that didn't harm local communities. And actually the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve is a place where, you know, there was a lot of negotiation about people were very passionate about where to put the marine reserve, what it should look like. And part of that compromise was to put it where it is today in a place that was not heavily fished um, and also uh, did not have a significant amount of that near shore habitat. And again, that ties back to the fact that um, Garibaldi is one of those very vulnerable ports. And so if you take away a little bit of a very small fishing area, it has a huge impact versus someplace with a much larger river <laughs> to be able to explore. Okay. Woof. On to coastal businesses. We're moving fish, we're leaving fisheries behind for the moment. Um, so again, we also have done some research in our associate economic monitoring that's looked at what were the impacts on different types of local businesses. Again, what are the economic impacts? What are the social impacts? Um, and what's happening over time? So initially, a lot of coastal businesses, excuse me, were concerned about having the reserves put, put into place, just not knowing really what, what that impact is going to be. We can think about maybe a tackle shop, not really knowing if the marine reserves are going to drive some business away. Um, but now, when we have gone back and done these business surveys again, basically concerns have declined. And there are actually reports of, say, tourism increasing in some areas related to the marine reserves, or just a neutral impact. We were afraid it was going to be a, a big impact in a negative way. It turns out there was no big negative impact. So it was neutral, but it, it wasn't what people expected. Uh, I will say, I didn't really put anything in here about positive impacts. The good news is that there are also positive impacts from the marine reserves, but I had to cut some things to be able to make it through this presentation in time. So we can talk about those next time. All right, quickly, again, just on some social impacts. So we know from our research that marine reserves didn't cause distrust 
in different communities along the coast, but it does act as a flashpoint for conflict among different types of stakeholders, mostly because it, it brings up people's passions about who should be making decisions about our coastal resources. Uh, you know, is it sort of people where seemingly the ocean is in their backyard that should have the most say in terms of, you know, what you do with our policies here locally? Um, or is it all Oregonians? Are Oregonians in Eastern Oregon? They have opinions, I'm sure, about fisheries and maybe marine reserves, hopefully marine reserves, part of that awareness increase. Um, anyway, and so they are just acting as a flashpoint for conflicts about any sorts of decision. But also a positive thing that we found is that there are common concerns among all the different stakeholder groups about the state of the ocean. Things that people you know, <laughs> desire to be improved, things that people are afraid of, things that people want you know, to make sure that we have a healthy ocean environment. And so it's very lovely to see that. Okay, another one of the goals uh, was research that informs nearshore management. And so now I'm gonna talk about the contributions, some of the contributions our program has made to nearshore management. Keeping an eye on my time, I think I'm gonna finish right at eight. I'm gonna try. So we have been able to have our data inform the stock assessment process. So just one example is that both our juvenile fish surveys from the Smurfs and also with our hook and line surveys, which includes data off of Cape Falcon and Cape Mears here, um, have gone into the most recent Cabazon stock assessment for 2019. Um, and this is just one example. There are some other examples uh, where data from our remotely operating vehicle has also been used in um, stock assessments for Kelp Greenling. Uh, we're currently working with the data people right now to share information on black rockfish and canary and copper rockfish for the upcoming stock assessment process that's happening as we speak. Uh, we've contributed data on sea stars to try to understand West Coast wide declines, specifically of the sunflower sea star, um, and are also working with colleagues to look at what's happening to some of the other subtitle sea star species. And so data from our dive surveys and from our remotely operated vehicle surveys contributed to an international listing of that sunflower sea star as critically endangered. And it's currently being evaluated for listing under the US Endangered Species Act. It's not just the ecological data that contributes to nearshore management. Uh, our social and economic human dimensions data uh, has been used recently to evaluate the economic impacts of sea otter reintroduction on the coast. That's a hot emerging topic that kind of, you know, is still in the decision-making process but the models we've developed to look and try and understand the economics of different management decisions are being used to inform those sea otter questions. And then there is a new ocean acidification and hypoxia um, council, which is looking at those um, impacts. So the low oxygen impacts and the impacts on say changing pH of the ocean on different shellfish species, and the data that we have about people's awareness about these issues, and we've also asked questions about the best about the best way to share messages and communications about some of these issues with the council so that they can plan their outreach and community engagement strategies. All right, way to lead into outreach and community engagement. Uh, so just a short summary that we have been able to do a little bit of work uh, in terms of outreach and community engagement, sort of here in Cape Falcon, definitely elsewhere, other marine reserves that are older. Um, but one of the things that we do is we focus on trying to get local vessel contracts um, to be able to support engagement with local uh, fishermen in our research. And so we do have uh, several contracts that have gone out of Garibaldi over the years. Um, and then pre-COVID, we put out a slice of science event, or maybe it was called Science on the Grill, down in Garibaldi, um, trying to share information with uh, various recreational and commercial fishermen 
um, about what we've been finding in the program. That was kind of on hiatus during the COVID years, uh, but we are excited to start picking up doing some of our outreach and engagement activities. Thankfully, we have these community groups like the former Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve that has now been encompassed in the NCLC, um, the Land Conservancy group up here, um, and really in a couple of the other reserves have really stepped in kind of in this absence from our team and helped, helped us be able to engage the local community. And I'm there I'm gonna say, do a great job with it. I'm gonna say, which contributes in part, I think to that 60% awareness uh, up here, which is really exciting. And so um, even though the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve Group just spun up in 2015, so not all that long ago, um, they've held over 54 events, just counting through 2020. Um, they helped translate some of our brochures into Spanish uh, about the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve and a big kudos that they were leaders on creating these hospitality packets that they uh, were handing out to local hotels and businesses, again, to help uh, inform the local community um, and visitors and raise awareness about the Marine Reserve. So a big thank you for all the work you've done and to the other community groups too. Okay. Oh, on to enforcement. The last slide, we're almost there, three minutes to go. Uh, another good thing that we know is that enforcement is happening across all of the marine reserves, including right here out at Cape Falcon. Uh, so we worked with the Oregon State Police as part of that 10 year report ooh, that I started this talk talking about. Um, to basically summarize all of the hours that they've spent patrolling, the number of convicts, and the number of citations that they've written. And so you can see Cape Falcon, ooh, still not there with the pointer yet, sorry. Uh, you can see Cape Falcon um, is down there and has quite a bit of, of hours uh, and some, some contacts. Um, there were a couple of citations that were, that were issued. So we, the good news is that we know these aren't just paper parks, right? They have enforcement to them. They have some teeth to them, which is great. Um, one thing we were able to do, again, working with the Oregon State Police, is calculate um, a compliance rate for the commercial crab fishery. And so we were able to look at how many boats are in the fleet, how many total violations they've had over a given time period. And it turns out, that the commercial crab fleet is actually doing a really great job with compliance, over 99%. I think that's better than anyone could have ever expected. And this is also really rare to be able to calculate a compliance rate for a fishery. Um, I don't actually have other compliance rates for the other fisheries because it's too hard to figure out what they are. It requires more time and we don't quite have that time yet. Um, but that is actually really promising to see. And another exciting thing to see in addition, oops, is that the one? Yep, that's the one, uh, is basically that we have uh, both fishermen and local community members contributing to compliance and enforcement. So we have multiple stories and multiple examples of fishermen kind of either trying to encourage each other to follow the rules or in calling OSP to report violations that they see. We have a really cool story actually from Cape Falcon about that. Uh, that's on the website. I don't have time to tell this story. Oh, it's eight o'clock, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, so I'm gonna say, go to the website and check it out in our research news section, uh, which is our blog, look for enforcement Cape Falcon. It's a great story. Um, and Community groups like the community at Arch Cape here, like the Roads End neighborhood at the Cascade Head Marine Reserve, people are really passionate about making sure that people are following the rules. Um, and again, I also think that's part of what, you know, the different community teams around the reserves have also been able to do is, you know, kind of let, in a friendly way, be not, let people know what you can and can't do in the Marine Reserve and, and make people aware. Anyway, so all that is just to say, if you can't tell already, I'm really excited about what the program has done over the last 10 years. We've worked really hard in a lot of those different components 
of the program, the program is up and running, it's moving forward. And I'm going to stop there, four minutes over time, hopefully it doesn't take 14. I'm not sure what time it says, but anyway, thank you for your attention, both online and in the audience. Um, if there's time for other questions, I'm happy to take them now. I'm happy to chat a little bit afterwards until they kick us out of the library. But um, thank you for coming. And thank you for the groups that hosted this talk series to be able to have this moment with us. Yes. Uh, first